I try to find connection, you know, <laughs> whenever um, I had an opportunity to interact with people and also have a first-hand observation of things. Hi, everyone. This is Marty. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Nepal Now on the Move, where you'll hear from some of the huge numbers of people leaving this country, as well as from some of the few who return to settle in their homeland. Once in a while, we'll invite an official or expert to help us understand these migrations. From Kathmandu to Kabul is not really that far in this era of daily intercontinental flights. And today's guest, Prem Awasti, is also fortunate in that he gets to make the return trip home at least every six weeks. But still, he already feels that less than a year after migrating to work abroad, his roots in his homeland are somehow shallower. If you missed it, Prem was the first ever guest of the show after we relaunched earlier this year to focus solely on migration and Nepal. In that chat, he told us about his early life in Doti district, in Nepal's far west region. When he spoke, you could hear his deep attachment to that place. So I wonder, for him, does living and working in Kabul not only mean being away from his country, but does it also signify one more step away from his deepest roots in his home village? In our latest chat, which we recorded at Himal Media in Patindoka, we also discuss if Prem has become comfortable in his new, less visible role in a much larger team that he's taken on in Afghanistan. His tasks there are much different than during the nearly two decades that he worked on the front lines of humanitarian assistance for the UN in Nepal. Finally, Prem has some thoughts for others who might be contemplating a similar move. Now, please listen to my chat with Prem Awasti. Prem Awasti, welcome again to Nepal Now on the Move podcast. Thank you, Marty. Good to be back. Good to see you again after eight months, roughly. Yeah, yeah, indeed, eight months. Okay. And thanks for hosting me again. My pleasure. I'm eager to hear about your life and what's been happening. And the first thing I wanted to ask you about is you've been back in Nepal now for a few days or almost a week. And um, I'm curious about what you really miss. Like, I know you do these trips fairly regularly. What are the things that you really look forward to other than the people, your family, obviously? Like, do you come back and think, oh, I have to have Momo or I have to go to... Shivapuri and hiking, or what are the things that you want to do first? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm here for uh, two weeks. And what I miss mostly is uh, more outdoor activity, which uh, due to security reason and due to other reason, it's been restricted uh, in, in Kabul. So I have very limited outdoor activities <laughs> there. So that is something I miss. In terms of food, I miss, uh, of course, dal bhat. <laughs> I'm not that uh, dal bhat person, but uh, once in a while to have a good full dal bhat set is, is quite good. Uh, and meeting with friends, uh, catching up, um, you know, chatting on the contemporary issues, so hanging around. So these are uh, uh, mainly that I miss mostly the socialization part uh, with family and also with friends. Of course, other activities going around, uh, walking, hiking, traveling. Do you hear much about Nepal when you're in Kabul, like through news or are you aware of what's going on in Nepal or not really? Um, I do follow, but not... um, on a day-to-day or, you know, like every event I don't follow because I don't have that much time uh, because I'm focused on other work. Uh, but in general, I'm updated, uh, but mostly 
uh, what's going particularly like weekly basis or at the end of day i try to look uh, through twitter okay and so how are things going in kabul like we said it's been about 8 months are you feeling comfortable there like do you have a a, a good routine set up and do you feel like it's a second home at least if it's not your real home I'm almost settled. Uh, yeah, it's been eight months um, in terms of my, you know, tuning in with my day-to-day life there. And I also gain more knowledge about first-hand uh, knowledge uh, about Afghanistan, its history, uh, ongoing issues, interacting with uh, Afghani people, and also picking up some local language, uh, trying to learn you know understanding more about afghani society its history and the whole this um, hindu kush himalayan region and how the cultures been shaped uh, so there are some uh, interesting um, reflection and knowledge almost yeah uh, in general i'm now quite used to and settled uh, in afghanistan so i was going going to ask you Obviously what took you there was a job and career but there's another side to your life and everyone's life the personal side and I was going to ask you about that because I know that because of security you need to live in a, a, a more secure confined space but from the response you just gave it sounds like you're not only focused on work like you are getting to know people and history and do you find that there are some things that engage you personally other than just the work Yeah there are some some personal activities as well and also mostly with other colleagues friendship with uh, local afghani people you know chatting with them sometimes listening them um even they share their pain gain you know that also brings another uh, perspective uh, in your life uh, engaging with uh, some physical uh sports type you know like spinning uh, yoga <laughs> so these are uh, some engagement outside of work uh, maybe running so you're keeping physically fit yeah i think uh, <laughs> i am more fit healthier <laughs> compared to 8 months ago <laughs> yeah i lose like 5 kg weight <laughs> wow oh, that's great you yeah. have partly because you have more time to do these things no Or yeah you- and also it's I um, cook myself. I do minimal cooking. <laughs> huh. And so also you're really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, um like dry fruits. Afghanistan is famous for dry fruits and um you know like breakfast making is smoothie out of those dry fruits and um having a meal of dry fruits is also quite healthy. <laughs> so there is less carbohydrates and uh, you know more uh, protein vitamin part so that may yeah, <laughs> be yeah. another reason okay well in the end it's good no yeah, matter it, how it, you get there yeah yeah right? is, as long is. as you don't start disappearing <laughs> then that's all positive although i'm sure when you come home everyone's saying oh my god you lost weight you lost weight you have to eat more yeah yeah turning to the work stuff when we talked the first time we talked a lot about your motivation you know the things that that you were considering about going or not going the decision you were making and i know that you really emphasized that you felt like you wanted to make a contribution you felt like you had made a contribution in your work here when you were working with the un and that you were looking forward to the opportunity to doing the similar thing but working at you know regional level and even global level and so i'm wondering after 8 months i know it's still a relatively short period of time but do you feel like you're making a contribution like do you feel like you're part of a bigger kind of positive project the way you were here in in nepal yeah i think um, the answer may be with diff- uh, two perspective uh one is uh, you know a lot of nepalis uh, they are uh, migrating um, most predominantly the migrant worker uh, whether middle east or malaysia and you know like um, how many nepalis are uh, in international organization at the global um, 
you know, globally contributing the global peace, security, promoting humanity. From that perspective, there are limited Nepalese uh, out there. So um, I think I also feel the sense of kind of uh, pride and also sense of responsibility that uh, as a global citizen, it's our duty uh, to contribute, uh, whether it's a global level or regional level. And so in that way, I, I'm quite satisfied and also quite motivated that uh, why not uh, Nepali can also contribute uh, at the global uh, regional stage, contributing, um, you know, promoting peace, security, and also promoting humanity. And other part, um, when you are in a new society, you also have a limited, uh, your navigating skill, and it may take time. And here, when I was working um, with UN in Nepal, you know, I was dealing with day-to-day -day activity, mostly the humanitarian issues, trying to find the solution to the problem. So sometimes, you know, there was more motivation. I was considering as a calling, you know, like, uh, but to contribute uh, at a global, regional level, there are challenges, there might be ups and downs, but still uh, you are contributing to the bigger agenda and also um, not as an individual, from representing uh, the country, society, and offering that assistance is also quite fulfilling. So it sounds like you're saying, and maybe I'm not quite understanding this, but it sounds like you're saying, you know, when you were in Nepal, working in Nepal, you were like a, a big cog in a smaller wheel. Now you're in Kabul, you're a smaller cog in a bigger wheel. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's kind that's, of a, that's a good, good uh, analogy. Okay, okay. And uh, are you happy being a smaller cog in a bigger wheel? Or do you think that at some point you would need to become a bigger cog in that Afghan wheel? Because... There are different roles in a way. Like I, I know you, you understand that this role is different, and so your own personal situation and work will be different. But that doesn't mean that you enjoy it as much, right? So you yeah. might enjoy one style more than the other. And I, you know, from what I, the little I know about your work here, you were very much a hands-on kind of person who had so many contacts, yeah. and you were able to go out and, like you say deal with things very directly. Yeah. And, and, and in Kabul, it sounds like it's quite different. Your role is more indirect. Yeah. Helping to keep something going. Yeah. Do you think you can get comfortable in the new role? I mean, uh, I'm in a learning curve. Uh, the current job requires different skill sets, knowledge, and also different um, sort of deliverables. I mean, one thing at a time, I mean, I'm, as I said, I'm in a learning curve and I will slowly catch up. Compared to my previous job here in my own society, in my own country, uh, I have a good connection uh, with, uh, you know, different national actors, local actors, leaders, international community, from senior uh, level to, you know, like common people. So which has uh, its own beauty, you know, to be connected um, so I'm not looking like a same kind of profile as I move on with my current um, job, but um, within a rank and file within that system, yeah, definitely I have my own goals, vision, how I move forward, but certainly at the global stage, learning more uh, diplomacy, learning more uh, skills, uh, more connecting with different societies and different uh, cultures that, that I'm learning. And I, I, I'm sure that I won't have the same visibility as I used to be, I used to have here in Nepal. Yeah. Now you strike me as very patient. I, <laughs> I, re I remember thinking about this before. You're someone who's very patient and you know where you want to go and, and you're willing to take the time to get there. I'm not sure I'm that patient, actually. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong or anything, but I appreciate that you really seem to have thought it through and see the steps and are willing to take the steps as they come. It's also how you reconcile with uh, your life. 
the work in Nepal uh, was quite challenging, and also you know um, you may um, be upset, frustrated uh, because things might not move, might not change. You may not be able to address the issues, feeling helplessness. So I have gone through those uh, kind of phases. But I was consistently doing that work for more than 15 years, particularly at the uh, front level or um, kind of as a front worker. So I think um, it was a time uh, for me to move on with another um, skill and also looking, you know, maybe another side of the work. So I, I think I'm prepared for next couple of years, focusing on my current job or looking around kind of similar uh, skill sets. So it gives another perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, everywhere there is a problem. I mean, in the Middle East, um, even uh, the place where I work, uh, in South Asia, there has been a problem. So looking uh, more from a uh, global perspective uh, is also another um, you know, perspective in life and also um, contribution. I might not be directly contributing more visibly, but uh, as a part of a global body working for that, um, definitely there is my contribution. Okay, enough about uh, <laughs> <laughs> enough about your your movement within the system or your how you see that. Uh, I wanted to ask you. You did talk about security, and last time we met. Um, which we didn't record, but we met, and I think you said that there was you still hadn't been able to move around Afghanistan much. Is that still the case, or have you had a chance to see some of the country? Uh, I moved around Kabul. Kabul is a beauty, beautiful, but big, big valley. So um, had an opportunity to move around Kabul, but uh, due to some reason, my travel um, in a countryside has been postponed. So I'm hoping that in the next uh, month, I might be able to go around in a, in a few location at the province level and, um, you know, feel the first-hand uh, experience. I mean, these are uh, this is quite big country and it has a diverse uh, social groups and also the geography. Some are quite uh, mountains, some are, uh, you know, close to... Um, the southern more uh, close to Iran, uh, I think even it is connected with China, the big person with Pakistan, Iran, Pakistan, Uzbekistan. So these are uh, the neighboring country. We were talking a bit before we started about uh, weather, rainfall, and, and the, the effects on the countryside if it rains heavily, possibility of landslides from these extreme weather events. The same thing obviously is happening in Nepal now during the monsoon. I know you said you haven't been out much, but do you see many parallels between Nepal and Afghanistan, you know, not only physically, but also in terms of uh, the people and socioeconomically? When you are doing your work on Afghanistan, do you think a lot about Nepal and compare them? Yeah, I try to find connection, you know, <laughs> whenever um, I had an opportunity to interact with people and also have a first-hand, uh, you know, observation of things. Uh, so it's a mountainous country, and uh, Nepal also has a huge portion of mountain uh, part, though it's it has a plain, but uh, mostly portrayed as a mountainous country. The weather uh, pattern unfortunately, is uh, impacting. The extreme events are um, happening. Last month, there was a big uh, flooding, lightning, and certain parts uh, get uh, heavily devastated. Uh, it used to be a rainfall shadow area, so the, the soil is more porous. It's like a Manang Mustang um, here in Nepal, so similar type of uh, geography and the soil uh, condition. In terms of cultures, people, there, there is a connection. Uh, particularly, there are uh, certain areas, uh, the mountain, real mountain um, community. So the, like a tea, uh, you know, there is a special uh, mountain uh, 
uh, tea here in Nepal. So similar tea you can find in Afghanistan, particularly among the mountainous community. The sheep herders um, you may find. And actually Afghanistan is quite uh, rich in different kind of herbs, um, high value uh, agriculture product, which uh, Nepal also has. And yeah, there are also like um, some connection with food and uh, the dumplings. There are different types of uh, dumplings they have, it's similar to momos here uh, in Nepal. Everyone's favorite food. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's favorite food. And yeah, they have um, also culture of dal, but uh, their cooking is quite uh, different. We have more soup style dal. <laughs> And uh, Afghani dal is, you can eat it. Uh, it could be like a staple. Mm. So these are connections. And also with clothing, um, yeah, I mean, how you see things, you know, if you see like from connecting perspective, you can connect things. When you try to divide, <laughs> then, you know, you may not see similarities. Uh, but I see a lot of uh, similarities in terms of pattern. And um, how family interact, uh, the family values um, is also quite similar. It's more joint family mm. and very much uh, interdependence part within a family. So these are uh, quite connecting things. I think you said to me last time that you come back every four to six weeks, roughly. Yes. Which on one hand seems fairly often. Uh, especially compared to some people who go overseas to work and don't make it back, you know, once a year or once every two years, whatever. But I'm wondering, do you find it difficult to be away even for a relatively short period of time? Like, do you feel like you're missing things with your family or you're able to quickly kind of jump in and catch up? It's difficult. Uh, psychologically, you are traveling, you are on the move. So there is kind of this psychological element, uh, being far away, being migrated. So I think your roots are getting more shallow. <laughs> so that kind of psychology thing impacts you one way or other. I mean, compared to like those who migrate for quite long, for months, for years, six months or two, three years. Uh, so I have a luxury of coming back every six weeks, at least four to six weeks, um, just to reconnecting with family, friends. But still, um, there is this psychological uh, kind of um, impact. At least your roots are getting shallow <laughs> in mm. your own, own soil. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. I was just talking to someone about this today, actually. We were talking about the fact that from his perspective, many Nepalese, when they leave the country, and these are more kind of professional people who relocate, soon after they arrive, they spend a lot of time talking about how bad things were in Nepal or whatever their home country is. But over the years, they get more nostalgic and then when they get close to retirement age, then they keep saying, well, I need to go back home and be back in my home soil and, you know, smell the air or whatever of my home country. And I think it's true of, of a lot of people. Um, Even, you know, like um, when we travel, when I travel to Western countries where um, you don't uh, see chaos in the street or... So living there like for more than a week, then you feel homesick, like streets are empty, you know. <laughs> Even in the uh, United States, in, in country sites where there is fairly less population, you don't see people, then <laughs> you feel homesick, um, not seeing people, not uh, confronting with any chaos. So we've been grown up. <laughs> it's part of like our <laughs> life here. But my, my wife says exactly the same thing. Um, when we li lived in other places, you know, fairly big cities, for her it's still too quiet because Kathmandu, there is just that, you know, that, that mix of so many things happening simultaneously that, that you don't get so much in, in Western cities. And like you say, sometimes it's chaotic 
and there are so many things coming at you from every possible direction. And, you know, when I, I try to keep up with what's happening in Afghanistan, like so many other places, and one of the news points that you hear about fairly regularly is how the treatment of women and girls under the Taliban. And obviously, it, it's a very difficult situation. And from what I can tell, it's not getting any better in terms of women's access to society and culture outside of the private house. Um, and I know that you have daughters and you're obviously married. And is this an issue that you think about? I'm not quite sure how to, how to put this, but yeah, beca yeah. because of that. Yeah. No, I can relate um, with me that context uh, because I have two daughters. Um, when I meet friends in Afghanistan, um, those who have daughter, they, they share stories that their daughters are crying um, like 16 years, 17 years. Uh, they are not going to schools. So, yeah, I, uh, I closely relate um, with that. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate uh, how women, girls, they have a limited uh, opportunities and all their rights been curtailed. It's heartbreaking to hear all those stories. Yeah, I guess that's when you're thinking about the work you're doing there and making a contribution, this could be like a motivating factor, something that your, your work ideally will help to improve the situation. I'm not trying to get you to make a political statement. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just yeah. saying if you, know, if you try to imagine your work concretely. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, um, the society is is governed with division of labor. Someone has to do uh, the work, and I have an opportunity to, to work um, on that country where there is a crisis. Um, so definitely, yeah, it's... Um, though I am not directly contributing, uh, but um, as uh, I'm working there, so there is some, some contribution from my end. Okay, so this is my... My last question, and it's a bit of a cliche question, but I'll ask anyway. So through all of these eight months in Kabul and traveling back and forth and then being home for these short breaks, what is one or two lessons? I hesitate to use the word lessons, mm. but what do you think are things that you've discovered, you know, either about yourself or about Afghanistan or about the, the UN, working in the UN? Are there things that have kind of resonated with you in this time? Yeah, it's quite a uh, reflective uh, question. <laughs> I need to reflect. Uh, but definitely looking uh, myself, where I want to go and how I want to contribute. And I had a good uh, opportunity to learn more about Afghanistan. So I've been reading like uh, even literature, uh, fictions uh, on Afghanistan. Um, it's really interesting to to know that. And once Afghanistan used to be like a hippie's trail, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know how whole things has gone, you know badly. This is again heartbreaking um, story. From um, you know societal, political, also there has been. Quite reflection, you know, like how this left, right, right, left um, things evolves over the time. Um, so that is also another um, kind of things for wondering, pondering, thinking for me. Not exact reflection, I had any conclusion, but something to think through. Yeah, on, on a migration also, um, you know, like how the movement is shaping the, the whole world um, and how it will evolve something to think uh, about. Uh, even there, there is a global crisis, whether it's the Middle East or, uh, you know, economic or um, different um, crises posed by the climate change. Um, so, yeah, it has given me an opportunity to think through and reflect um, and also looking from more... Um, macro perspective, more, uh, you know, from the global uh, side. So these are 
some immediate uh, reflection, uh, but I'm hoping that there will be something more <laughs> concrete that I would be able to share with you. Okay, well, we'll, we'll keep talking. <laughs> and sorry, one more question. There will be other people following you out of Nepal, going to work for a big organization, not necessarily the UN, but something like that. After your eight months, what advice would you give people who are doing a similar sort of thing as you? I think, um, yeah, first, um, if there is an aspiration, if someone aspires to work internationally as a professional, it requires some preparation um, mentally, perhaps uh, more than other things, and also looking into the skill sets, what skill sets uh, might be used, and also in which culture, context, that um, the job will require. And uh, most important is embracing the um, diversity, ready to be work in other culture, context. So definitely if you have a passion to work uh, abroad internationally, of course, um, you will bring that ingredient. If you aspire, even you don't have a passion, but you have to make a passion, uh, working internationally, embracing global values, um, diversity, and being open, uh, open-minded in terms of learning and understanding other culture. So th this kind of attitude will help one to uh, definitely speed up. Do you, I know I said that. Yeah, that was yeah it, please, please. Do you feel like you were prepared when you went in all those ways? Yeah, I was, I was putting effort. So it was not like, um, you know, bang. I was applying and I was reading. I was preparing myself. Um, it was like a quite uh, long thinking and working. <laughs> Yeah, I had to put a good effort. Okay, well, I think that goes back to what I was saying about you before, how patient you are and how you plan things ahead. <laughs> so it sounds like in this case, it was very beneficial that you have that that personal trait, I think. Yeah, I think, uh, I think um, so. I haven't uh, actually reflected. Perhaps, uh, yeah, I can get more inspiration from this chat. Uh, to reflect more on my journey, how I came to this point. Um, okay. Well, I'm ha very happy if you're getting <laughs> inspired by our chat today. So thank you again for doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time and your limited time that you have here uh, back in Kathmandu. And hopefully we get to chat again one day. Thank you, Marty, and uh, having me again. And I really appreciate uh, you taking time and giving me an opportunity. Thanks again to Prem Awasti for chatting with me today. I'm happy to say that in more than four years, he's our first return guest on the show. Let us know what you thought. You can text Nepal now by clicking on the link at the top of the notes to this or any episode. You can also email me at nepalnowpod at gmail.com or leave a comment on any of our social channels. We're at nepalnowpod. 